Hello and welcome back. This is the second session of discounted cash flow modeling in Python. In today's session, I will be talking about corporate finance versus valuations. What is what are their differences? And I'll be covering corporate life cycles and the stakeholders in the given business. So let's get it started. What's the difference between valuations and corporate finance? In corporate finance, we look at the business from inside. We look at how we can deploy capital, how we can grow the business, how we can gain efficiencies. In valuations, we look at the business from outside. Investors looking at the business and say, given how it is being run, how much they should be paying for such a business. And that pretty much summarizes the difference between those two. Every business, just like human beings are born, they are just an idea, then they play around, they do trial and error, just like we do. We make a lot of mistakes, we grow up, and then hopefully we become some mature, responsible individuals. And then there is a decline phase and death is upon all of us. That's not a fun part. That's not a nice part that anyone wants to talk about or think about it, but that is inevitable. And companies are not very much different. There were thousands or maybe millions of companies that were born they went bankrupt, they became irrelevant. Some of them, we heard their names like the East India Company, and then a lot of them that are, we never heard their names, similar to the people who died. In order to value an asset or specifically a company, you need to be able to determine where you are, where the asset is relative to its life cycle, whether it is a young, company or a startup or a mature or still is growing. So relative where they are, you can estimate the revenue, the growth rate, the operating income margin, and so on to assess the value of the business. Even though it is a corporate finance concept, it is not separated from valuation. As I believe the corporate finance and valuations are joined at the hip. So if you are thinking of valuing in a startup company, you have to assess about the uncertainty that comes with it. The business model can change. The product that they are shooting for can change. The failure rate is higher. When it's a growth company, they have perhaps proved a business concept. They've been funded. VC put money in there. But there is still uncertainty about how they get market share, how they go to market, how consumers re react to their goods or services. And then the scaling up part comes along. That how they scale up, how they reinvest business. They could have a great product, great idea, but they could be paying up too much for reinvestment. They could do bad investments. And then there you go, you won't get to Nirvana. And then when they are ceasing to exist, you need, you don't need, a, they don't need to have a visionary CEO. They, have, they need to have a, such a CEO that can sell the asset at the well price and cease to exist and return the money back to the shareholders. And then shareholder will decide what to do with their money. They would go and put it in the new companies. They would put it in the startups and so on. The wealth is not destroyed. It's not a zero sum game. The wealth is created. And it's during that life cycle that companies do not need the great CEO, but the right CEO relative to that life cycle they are to make those decisions. As an investor, it is your job to assess that. The business has many stakeholders. But it boils down to two. It's shareholder, the equity part, and the bondholders. Well, they have contractual claim. We can talk about preferred shares, the callable bonds. We can dance around these, but it's really those who have contractual claim on the cash flow of the business and those who don't. So let's talk about banks and holders. They provide the capital that you need, but in return, they demand a fixed interest rate or could be a floating interest rate. But essentially, they have contractual claim. In order for them to provide that capital, they demand something in collateral. That's usually an asset. You could leave the underlying asset of the business as collateral and raise capital from bondholders. Think of it if you're running a store, a grocery store. Let's say you own the title, you own the place, but you want to open a second one and you don't have the capital to go and buy another one. Or you may be able to rent it, but you don't have all the capital that you need to put all the shelves, do all the designs, get the, all the groceries to put in the, to stock the shelves. So you could go to your bondholders, you could go to your bank and say, hey, this is my business. This is how I've been doing and I want to open a second locations. And based on your financials, they demand your in income statement, your balance sheet. And then you come up, they come up with how much capital they would be willing to provide you at what interest rate. And then you guys negotiate and go from there. But then in return, they could hold on to the title of the first store. So what happens if your second store fails? 
they can, and you're not able to pay them back, they can just sell your first store and then seize you to, and you will cease to exist and they get back their money and they recoup. On the other hand, you could go to shareholders. You can go to your friends or family members where they have capital they can provide to you. They wouldn't demand something fixed in return, but you would promise them once you start making money, you would give them back dividends or buyback. That's how it is referred to in public companies. But it essentially is they're laying down cash, and when you make profit, they want some of your profit. And there's no contractual claim. It's not 1%, 2%, 5%, etc. They get whatever is left. They are the last folks in the line. Shareholders are the last person in the line. Think if you have a make a revenue, you sell a goods and service or product, you take care of your vendors, you pay them, you pay your employees, you pay your suppliers, you have to pay your taxes, and whatever is left is going to be a split between banks and shareholders. Again, you banks, bondholders, they do come first, and then it's anything if it's left, goes to shareholder. In public companies, we leave that decision at the discretion of managers, how much they return cash to shareholder as dividend or buyback. There is virtually no difference between dividend or buyback. Mathematically, economically, they are exactly the same. If you walk, if you walk through the math, you will understand the only difference is the tax options that comes with the buybacks, where you will only pay the tax on that capital gains whenever you sell the assets. However, on dividend, whenever it's paid out to you, you have to pay the tax on it. This is exact. This is the only difference between dividend or buyback. And there are a lot of myths out there that say, "Oh, buyback is is evil. Buyback is this. It's it's that." Whenever you just hear that, you know there is someone that they don't know what they're talking about. Now let's talk about the first principle of a business. The first principle of business is to maximize the value of the firm. Again, the value of the firm is what belongs to bondholder and the shareholder, not just shareholder itself, but bondholder as well. It boils down to the investment decisions that the, those people who are running the business have to make, the financing decision and the dividend decision. They need to assess the projects based on their risk profile and invest in them if they're making their cost of capital. The financing decision comes down to what would be the right mix of debt or equity for financing decision. Again, let's go back to the example we talked about. You're buying it, you're opening a second store. Should you do all equity, go to your friends and family or even a public market raise equity to do so? Should you raise all that money from your banks uh, or, or issue bonds? Or should you do a mix like a 50-50, 60-40, 70-30? What should be the right mix to do so? So... That comes to the financing decision. There are mathematical formula where you can calculate how to optimize the cost of capital. And a, a cost of capital means essentially reducing the cost of raising money. Of course, debt is cheaper than equity, but high debt, high leverage comes with risk. It pushes up your, the risk profile of your business, and it also makes it harder for you to raise debt down the road if you come across more projects that are seems appealing but then you have a lot of debt on your balance sheet and then bondholder would be reluctant to lend you more money so these are everything is a trade-off the people the management who are running the business are in charge of making those decisions when the dividend decision comes when the business grows it produces excess amount of cash it's a management decision okay how much are we going to give back to the shareholders and how much we're going to keep to reinvest back into the business. If you are interested in learning more about corporate finance, as I mentioned in the previous session, you can go to Professor Aswath the Modern Corporate Finance course at NYU here at YouTube. Watch all the lectures, do the homework and so on and you will get a better understanding. This was my attempt to just cover the high level of what corporate finance is about and thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next session.